looks like you have a Q&A set up. Is that what this is for? Is somebody going to moderate it? Well, <laughs> why, why y'all are getting set up? Why the hijackings were going on that Sister Kathleen was talking about. My parents were there. My in-laws were there. Our niece and nephew, so you know their mind was blown. I'm, I'll never forget that. <laughs> Neither will they. <laughs> Where were they dead? But uh, what's interesting, in 75, uh, the Algerian government offered D.C. citizenship. But he had to become a Muslim. And I, I know he wasn't going to do that. He was like, ah, oh, nah, 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 nah. But the one thing, when Kathleen was talking about friendships, um... He had gone to Brazil. That's another story. <laughs> but he's down in Brazil, and I said, uh, oh, I'll have to learn to speak Spanish. And he said, no, they speak Portuguese. Don't you know nothing? <laughs> of course, I was like, I'll fix you, boy. <laughs> well, I didn't speak to him for almost uh, two or three years. And then uh, some brothers out here in California said, Sis, we got to get him back to France. He's... And in Brazil, you have to cross the border to get your uh, passport stamped or something. He missed the bus. He had a phone book. This is to show you how you must, you never know who you're going to need tomorrow. Okay? And. He asked the guard at the border, he said, uh, can I make one phone call? And the guard said, okay, what number? He said, this is just an example of how important people become. He said, Vice President Nixon, Ford, whatever, some president, right? And the guard went, you know them? And he dialed the number and the man said, give him anything he wants. So when he was telling me this story about going back to France, he said, Barbara, you never know who you're going to need tomorrow right, right, right. and how that works. Because I remember he had to get the uh, permit to work, or, and he couldn't come out at night for almost a year. But it was like a federal judge that said, here, you got to permit friendships friendships. And in France, I discovered a uh, very large Jewish population that had been around since World War II. And I was very shocked. I mean, somebody picked me up one day and said, stand on that corner. No, stand in there. Oh, you the American. This man took me to the 23rd floor of this palatial apartment. He was like the vice president of Ritz Crackers or something, you know, something like that. I was like, okay. And a lot of us would not have made it if it wasn't for friendships. None okay. of us would have made it. <laughs> <laughs> are, we, yeah. are we supposed to do a Q&A here? Can we get a moderator? Can we get a volunteer? Those mics are all good to go. My name is Jazz Monique Hudson. I'm moderate this uh, Q and A session. Okay. 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 <laughs> okay. Say that again. Say that again. Okay, I'm gonna step up. Um, I will say before I step up, let's keep um, the questions to questions, long, elongated statements. Um, yeah. I know as how we're all blessed to be here amongst you sisters, but let's keep them to questions. Um, and under a minute, please. Your question under a minute. Okay. All right. Okay. Yes. Yes. Um, good morning. I'm going to use my minute for part statement, part question, if you don't mind. I will, I will be very brief. Okay, I'll be very brief. Okay. I am a professor at San Francisco State University. I am so happy that so many people here are from San Francisco State and what you have done. Okay. Uh, secondly, I'm Palestinian. I'm inspired by the Black Panther Party, what you have done, what you have been doing, and your position from the time that you have started until today with people who are continuing day in and day out. 
struggling and supporting uh, independence, uh, justice, freedom all over the world. I was wanted to ask you to two questions. One is if you mentioned John Genet. John Genet was supportive of the Panthers. He was also very supportive of the Palestinians. You also were in Algiers, which was the, or the first, the Algeria, the first country. And the reason that it actually, maybe it wasn't the first country, but it was the reason it welcomed the Panthers, it because it had just come out of a decolonial, decolonial process and actually fought a, a war liberation yeah. thing. So I was wondering if you can actually speak to the whole question of connections of national liberation movements, yes. the Panthers, let me, and, and the second question I'm asking you is about the history, the history, because there is a lot of ways in which our histories get, I'm not talking about actually our, I'm not talking about the Palestinian history, it's okay, that's another thing, about the history of the Panthers and the history of the women and the ways in which the histories of struggle get erased and written in the different ways. And it's, this is conference is really important to do that. So I'm just wondering if you can elaborate more on that. Yes, thank professor, you. You have a professor okay. question. Okay. I wanted I wanted to tell you. I want to tell you that the first people in Algiers, uh, when we became publicly there, we were in the Pan-African Cultural Festival. The very first people we worked yeah. with were Palestinians because they could speak English. Yep, yep. <laughs> and they were there and they understood. Mm -hmm. And they were, some of them are quite young and had very radical, intense ideas. And they identified with us. Time. and. You know, yeah. it's just like to talk about killing and who were they going to kill, who were they going to kill first. <laughs> you know, I mean, we, we did that too. You know, yeah. so. But we, no, they were young, they were all men, and they were very, very, very upset about America, which is backing Israel. And so we had a natural affinity um, with the Palestinians. In fact, when we were invited to the Pan-African Cultural Festival, they gave us like a storefront, but we had to fix it up. You know, who helped us? Palestinians, because we could speak English. You know, so it was very, mm -hmm. and that solidarity continues until I think a group, some people are here that went in a group, what is it, Claude? Did you go to Palestine? There was a delegation from here. How many people went with you? Yeah, yeah, so you win it. It's your delegation. Okay, cool. But no, this is a sort of a natural affinity of people who don't really have control over their country. They have a nationality, is not respected. They're treated like uh, second-class citizens. So we, we have a lot of affinity. We love you, and we know you love us. Okay. <laughs> uh, thank you, first and foremost, for everything. Thank you. Uh, I'm Jocelyn Imani. I have a question. Um, so m many of us today are wrestling with this issue of gender, fragile masculinity, toxic masculinity, feminism, womanism. How do we identify? How do we, you know, all of that jazz. So can y'all speak to one, did you or do you identify as feminist? Um, and how did you deal with those questions of gender in your time? Well, let's oh, say, let me get started. Yeah. Let's start. Let's start. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I myself do not identify as a feminist because I can remember back in the 60s and the, and the mm -hmm. 70s, you know, it, it seemed like a ploy to divide us, yeah. you know. And I always say, hey, it wasn't about women being ahead of the men, women being wherever. No, we're all getting oppressed, yeah. Yeah. you know. Yeah. So I think that that is just a ploy to divide us. I really do. Well, I would like to say, what we functioned under was a different structure, different mental structure, solidarity. Yes. Mm -hmm. We are in solidarity with people who are fighting imperialism. We are in solidarity with people who are fighting racism. We are women in solidarity with men. The men are in solidarity with yeah. us. So the concept of collaboration, working hard together, instead of identity. Identity does not necessarily Come mean on. you're going to be a revolutionary. It's going to mean you right. have an identity. Right. Um, and I, I remember um, when I was stationed in Philadelphia and coming from the West Coast, they thought that was very important. And uh, they put women out front. And that question of feminism, the only thing that ever meant to me was, you don't have to wear a bra. Get the hell out of here, you know? Um, but like Kathleen said, all of us had to learn how to break down, clean a gun. And you better know how to shoot. Come on. So 
uh, when the enemy's coming at you, he don't ask you, are you a feminist? Yeah. Are you an LBGT? He, don't, he knows who you now. are. That's right. So, um, and when I look through history books on what I call black women's history, strength has always come from Mother Nature, okay? So labels don't mean nothing unless you're um, willing to die for them. Yeah, that's right. Come on. So I see we have a line forming over here. So, sister, I'm going to take you and then I'm going to come back this way. So we're going to go side to side, all right? Because this line seems to be a little bit longer. Um, and again, let's keep your question to under a minute. Um, no, no statements, just questions. Okay. Just questions. Okay. Hi. Thank you so much for sharing today. It's really great to be here. Um, it's an inspiration. I'm a member of the Freedom Socialist Party. It's a socialist feminist group in the Bay Area and internationally. And um, I know that one of the things that contributed to the success of the Black Panther Party was a revolutionary program with Marxist roots and strong women like you working so hard. And so... I guess, can you share what you think would be effective organizing tactics to continue to agitate and mobilize the people in the U.S. and internationally, and your thoughts on, about the importance of holding strong to a Marxist, feminist, anti-capitalist program and working across color lines and international struggles? Thanks. Wow. <laughs> wow. That's a three-part three question. Yeah, that's a three-part three part question. Will anybody get a degree when we answer it? <laughs> you know, we, I, I, my husband and I lived in a socialist country. My husband and I lived in Tanzania, still live in Tanzania, which was a working socialist country, you know. And to me, socialism can really work, but I think on a small scale, you know, I think that when you start getting into uh, implementing socialism or Marxism or, 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 or communism or whatever, on a large scale, it, it just changes. You know, I think that what we have established in Tanzania at our community center is really, really an example of working socialism. You know, where everyone has a voice. Uh, you know, we don't say uh, uh, feminists, uh, we don't uh, abide by fem fem feminist principles, but everyone has a voice, you know. And one of the ways that we have been able to really affect change is through hip-hop, you know. And I'm talking about positive hip-hop, conscious hip-hop, because that encourages international solidarity, and you can see it in every country. So, and that's a practical thing to do. You know, you can talk about lofty ideals and all that, but you got to be practical yeah. in this emergency situation that's ringing the world. Yeah. yeah. Also, um, very often um, young people come and you're invited to classrooms and, well, what do you think we should do now? I'm not the one to ask. Right. <laughs> okay? I can only tell you what happened yesteryear. Right. You know, you can talk to uh, your contemporaries. But the thing that I've noticed is I also advocate talking to your parents, grandparents, that crazy uncle that likes to drink wine and talk shit. Okay. Uh, but the bottom line really becomes, uh, Kathleen gave me her smartphone a minute ago and told me, well, uh, push that and go and find out the date. I ain't got a clue. Okay. I get my email, I know how to open stuff, I know how to send it, it's your time, you got Facebook, you, you have the technology, okay? So, um, we can go back to yesteryear and talk about Marxism and all that, but the bottom line really is, not too much is going to change unless you change it. But I would advocate, I would advocate be careful, because the beast that chased us, he's a monster now. He is real. And 9-11, um, I told my girlfriend, why don't you change your name? Go back to Mary Jane. <laughs> because this beast is a beast. 
and the technology that he has been, and the laws, I would definitely say some of the laws, that we don't even know about. Right. In Oregon, if you collect rainwater, you got to pay for it. Come on. So, or, or they, I mean, come on. It's so much going on. There's no shortage of information or stories that a mi million people can't share. You know, it's not just about some Marxism now. It's about, will you live to see 50 years go by? I just want to be very brief and respond that what we were dealing with, and we knew all those terms, and we studied those ideologies. We had political requirements and political uh, education classes, and we read the Red Book uh, and many other things. However, what's important is the practical application. Yes. Yeah. Not in, in ideological purity. And that's what happens even in countries that have a socialist government. That they have to deal with the practical application. So where that, that's what it's about. Um, yeah. That's it. Let's, next question. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> Greetings. My name is Falila Aisha Bilal, daughter of Rafiq Bilal and Saisa Neal. So I was born um, into the Black Power Movement in Washington, D.C. My parents were founding members of the Black Man's Volunteer Army of Liberation, a very similar paramilitary um, agency in the East Coast, similar to the Panthers here. And my question is actually connected to what you were bringing up. This element of us as movement builders and how we heal and care for ourselves. I'm so thankful and I was brought to tears when Mama C was speaking in the very beginning because I'm here with some high school students. We have an all girls program of girls, black and Latino girls. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so for me, yeah, okay. thank you. For me and Jazz to be here and to bring our students here, and we were both raised in a black power movement, it's like the circle is complete. And the completion of that, and my question is around how you care for self. I loved it, Mama Barbara, when you said, I'm a human. Like this whole time I was pregnant. You know, I'm not just this, mm -hmm. this, this political activist that people read about. And so yeah. I was wondering if you could speak to those of us that are still here working day in and day out about how we care for ourselves and maybe some of the lessons that the Panthers didn't have 50 or 40 years ago that we need to hear as young activists now. And thank you, Mr. Lindsay. You know, I think, I think there was a mistake in that mm -hmm. we were following the Marxist line so closely mm -hmm. that we adhere to what Marx said, uh, uh, religion is the opiate of the masses. I think that we forgot our spirituality as African people, as people of color, as human beings. Spirituality and embracing that spirituality, looking back to our ancestors, to learn from our ancestors is one of the most powerful things that you can do to heal yourself and to build our communities. I advise you all, never forget your spirituality. That's very, very important in the healing process. Yes, it is. Yes. You made a statement. Uh, you said those of us who are still here. We're still here. Yes. Uh, like I said, your parents are still here, grandparents, crazy uncle in the corner. <laughs> Um, and, and you got to talk to everybody. You got to talk to them because um, they all have some little history that's going to energize you and keep you going. So uh, everybody's still here. Yeah, we just you. slower. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Oh, <laughs> We need to get to the more questions. Can I, can I take this brother right here? Our sister with the hat, you, you were standing in the line first? Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Kia ora. Um, I'm from um, the Polynesian Panther Party in New Zealand. I just want to pay my respect. As a minister of culture and their first community worker. I just want to pay my respects. This is a statement. No questions from me. Everything that you've said today has, has just so, and I just want to bring our love from our people, from Aotearoa, New Zealand. We have um, six members attending today. Wow. Uh, two are in, and my Could, sister Betty here? Seal. Woo! Betty Seal. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah. Oh, oh. Okay. Yeah. All right. 
and we also had three other brothers that are attending Emory Douglas's um, workshop um, this morning. We are being hosted by Emory. Um, but what I want to say, I just really want to give thanks for you three sisters and for all the sisters, Erica Huggins and, um, and also Elaine Brown, who we met this morning. So utterly respects, respects, respects. And just so we followed the uh, Black Panther Party um, from their 10 point program, and that's how we started. We're 45 years old this year. Wow. So we had our celebrations wow. and um, things. Yeah. Um, in New Zealand, um, and we will have to start preparing for our 50th. So we're still going, and yes, I understand we have children, grandchildren, and respect and to your children and to your mukupunas, which is grandchildren, to your families, yeah. and you know that we can still tell the stories and have the stories recorded. They're not stories; they were life. Yes, yeah. and they still um, continue yeah. to be okay. our life. Um, and without that um, uh, turn point platform um, form program from the Black Panther Party, we wouldn't be able to accomplish and continue to accomplish um, our um, struggles, which are the same here yeah. as today, right today. Yeah. Yeah. It's the same thing. Yeah. We have done workshops around um, mm -hmm. um, California, and people go, wow, we didn't know we've showed um, you know, um, um, PowerPoints, and they didn't realise what was, you know, how intense it was yeah. down at, we're at the end of the earth, New Zealand. <laughs> okay. So, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou koutou. All, right. All, right. All power to the people, salute! Much respect! Yeah, respect! Yeah! Yes, yeah. Excuse me. Are there any um, Native Americans in this oh, audience yeah, right yeah. now? That, especially anybody that's dealing with that damn pipeline. No. Yes? Okay. Okay, well, no, that's all right. That's all right. I just wanted to acknowledge that the struggle that's going on. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. So uh, first of all, thank you so much for speaking to us, but also more than that for the sacrifices you've made in the past and still, you know, uh, undergo. So uh, this question has to do with some remarks that Sister Barbara Easley Cox made early on about the value of masks, you know, tactically as you know one proceeds and you know. Uh, no. Uh, see, see, yeah, right in the beginning you said. No. Oh, go ahead. Did you mean mass that you put on your face? No, of course mass. not. Of course not. Emotions. Mass. Emotions. What did yeah. you say? You mean what like the, the theory, the mass theory? No, you, you talked about how sometimes if you go downtown, you got to put on a certain mask for the purposes of, you know, uh, yeah, begging for money. Yeah. Mass. Right, right, right. Mass. Right. Okay, so I asked about this because yesterday at some panels, a lot of uh, organizers, activist types, were asking this kind of question around how to get resources. And at one point, now, no, hold up. So we know that, obviously, the party got money from, like, white liberals at times, got money from the community. But uh, Elaine, And it, selling newspapers. Right. And now, Elaine Brown also talked about, sometimes, uh, the party just took shit, right? Now, uh, you, you mentioned Carlos uh, Marighella earlier, right? The term for this is expropriations. Uh, now... The field marshal marshals knew this, right? Former members of the Black Liberation Army knew this. Exiles. All right, so the lumpen proletariat. Now, I apologize, I apologize. <laughs> I, I got to situate this because it's, it's, it's an important question. I asked this as an organizer, organizing the Bronx. I asked this as a theorist. Uh, I'm doing a PhD at History of Consciousness where Newton did his, his work, right? So my question is about, for our generation, when we hear about the history of the Black, of the Black Panther Party and excluded is some of that, these illegal acts that had to be illegal to be successful, had to be illegal, had to be kept quiet to be successful. How, how do um, members, you know, our, our uh, BLM generation now, how do we think about that stuff when... You know what? Yeah. There's somebody who can explain it to you, if he wants to. 
the love? And and that's all, it. That's a, I mean, that's a real question, but I don't know how much people want to talk no, about that. No, no. Yeah. And let, let, let him. Yeah. Work. Let but, loud, yeah. And but now take him out back and talk to him. <laughs> don't. <laughs> Stay here. Stay here. Everybody wants to hear this. Yeah. Don't. Um, a lot of things. A lot of things are in the federal record. You can learn a lot of things about the Black Liberation Army if you study the cases of Black Liberation Army, of a Black involving Black Liberation Army members. I uh, too often hear people say, we've been following the case, we've been following the case. Had people write me and say, oh, we're so proud of what, what you did, brother. And like, I ask them, well, what did I do? You know, study the case. Study the case and study what, study what the prosecutor says and study what the defense lawyer says. Mm -hmm. And then you'll get, you'll get your stories. Study the, study the case and study the background material. Uh, like for instance, in the in the in the case of uh, Dr. Matulu, the United States versus Dr. Matulu Shakur, while we were defendants, we studied a lot of newspapers, and that's how we found out that there were a lot with the through the through studying the the police record. That's how we found out that there were a lot of people, a lot of young black people who were trying to emulate the Black Liberation Army. So it didn't come from. Uh, me making a speech at the 50th anniversary, mm -hmm. it came from people, that's how we learned more about, yeah. that's how we learned more about our struggle, by studying about it. And I, you know, encourage yeah. people to study about, study. study about, you know, study struggle, study revolution all around the world, but study revolution in the United States. Right. Study your own revolution and study every aspect of it, particularly those, those, those cases that involve members of the Black Liberation Army, okay. and you'll get a wealth of information. Yes. Thank you. Oh. Thank you. Okay. So the line is getting longer, and just for the sake of time, uh, about 10 minutes to one, we're going to take the second to last question. So I would just ask that you be uh, very intentional about your time and ask the question. Okay, hi. Uh, St. James came all the way down from Florida with the Dream Defenders. Um, squad, squad. Uh, thank y'all so much for the wisdom. This is just unbelievable. All right, so my question real quick is, um, Ms. Cleaver, this might be a, quite a touchy subject, but um, uh, the rift between Huey Newton and Eldridge Cleaver, um, I'm wondering how much of that was um, government influence, COINTELPRO, and how much of that was real. And I think uh, uh, you were talking about friendship and what we can do to avoid things like that tearing apart an organization. Well, I can speak about that only because after many years, Huey explained it. The deal was this. Huey was um, on a phone call with Eldridge and he said some things that were really crazy, et cetera, et cetera. And ultimately he said, well, you, you know, you don't agree with this. I'm going to kick you out of the party. What I was going to say, it was very, it was kind of obscene and crazy. However, a few years later, he said, well, he was so high on cocaine, he didn't even know what he said. That's right. So the whole, it, it was pro provoked by a, mm -hmm. a behavior that he shouldn't have been engaged in, and now how he got so strung out on cocaine, I don't know. I don't know who did this, okay? So it was real, but he didn't even know what he was saying. And he told us that once he was back in uh, San Quentin for something he did. It was there temporarily, and he called, and he called me. He wanted to apologize. I mean, I was flabbergasted. Mm -hmm. And um, so it was, that's the a, that's a story. And a lot of the, the split went down because of COINTELPRO. You know, this sending letters to, to one leader or another, oh, this person is out to get you and this and that. That, that was, you could look at, at, at records now because of Freedom Information Act where they have a, a brought it out with magic marker. And you can actually see why we were targeted. 
You know why we were tired, and many people don't know that COINTELPRO actually started in the 50s, if not the 40s, you know, to prevent a black messiah coming to the fore. So yeah, a lot of that was because of Pro and, uh, COINTELPRO, and I, I, I presume just about all of y'all know what COINTELPRO, if you don't, you can look it up. Yeah, but, but thank you for... for Yes, yes, brother. And you said to prevent that happening again? Yes. Well, you can't prevent it. That's right. How can you prevent it? You, you can't know? prevent it, but you can be conscious that it's happening. Yes, yeah. yes. Well, hey, and especially right. with the technology that you use. I mean, um, <laughs> Pam Africa called me one day and she said, I'm lost. I said, oh, well, I'm still standing on Broad Street. And so she said, well, maybe this damn phone will take me to Broad Street because it can do, it, it can do everything. So technology, uh, even though it's a great piece of um, moving forward, be aware of what you're doing with that thing. But I would just say, yeah. what's most important, yeah. really most important, is face-to-face -face contact, knowing people, knowing their families, knowing where they live, yeah. don't take stuff for granted, and you have organizations in which you have people who come in, infiltrate, etc. Who are these people? You have to communicate, acknowledge, and I, I, I just got to the point where I had vibes. I went to a, the first Black Panther meeting before there was any Black Panther party. They said, the Panther is coming in, in New York, New York City, mm -hmm. and... Yeah. Um, Sam Anderson, some of you might know him from New York, was there. I met him there. And there was a man. He had a little gray, beige kind of raincoat, real tight little haircut, little light-skinned Negro. And I just got a bad sensation, and I said, hmm, something's wrong with him. Well, he was a policeman. That's what he was. He was a policeman. Yeah. Yeah. And you can pick up on it. You might not accept it. You might not know what it is, but you just pay attention. Ask questions. It, it, we can't prevent infiltration. But you can be conscious of it and counteract it. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Nellie Wong and born and raised in Oakland Chinatown. Okay. And um, a longtime activist uh, with Radical Women and the Free Socialist Party. I just want to, I don't have a question, but I want to share a story. Okay. All right. Okay. I will do that. Yeah, we'll be moving around. Where do you think the divide comes from? The divide. When Which divide? We are debating or arguing still about whether feminism or womanism is connected to revolutionary politics. Um. Because I think they're connected and the system, the capitalist system, divides us. Thank well, you. as long as you're doing community work, as long as you're doing something to empower our communities, you know, I say right on. Yeah, so we, we just dispense with those labels and just try to join together. You know? Also, I think yeah. you have to acknowledge that in the black community, the vast majority of political work and social work and other kind of work women do. I mean, that's, you know, there's not a divided up. We're not doing it because we're feminists. Or we, because it has to be done, and that's part of the culture. And I think that's true in other more exploited areas than in the majority. And so I think those questions come out of the majority experience, but the reality of struggle is a little different in the minority communities. Yeah. 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 So I'm going to go ahead and uh, cut the question line off at the sister on this end and a sister here in the back, um, and we will take no more questions after those two people. Thank you. All right, thank you. I'm gonna go straight to the question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the Vietnam War was the first time in which African Americans and, and white folks and other folks fought together. Over 7,000 black men died in the war, and the Black Panthers were actually active in Vietnam, and you had mentioned, yes, they were, um, active in, in racial tension, trying to, uh, like, fix some of the stuff that was going on that was going on in the United States 
in Vietnam. So you mentioned the Vietnam War and a newspaper you mentioned that you were part of, um, and a delegation that you attended. So I'm wondering if you could talk more about that and your uh, work in Vietnam or work that you know of other plant panthers in Vietnam or going to Vietnam. Or well, I would just say so much more than the brothers who were in Vietnam yeah. who came to the party, extraordinarily significant. So what happened to them, they did it here, but they were influence in particular I'm thinking of Geronimo Giaga yeah, yeah. yeah who was sent for a second tour of duty to Vietnam after Westmoreland took a delegation up to uh, Detroit to quell the rebellion and unfortunately for uh, the rebellion unfortunately for Westmoreland a significant number including Geronimo of soldiers uh, aided and abetted the the, the revolutionary the snipers etc and they were sent for a second term in Vietnam as punishment oh so uh, there's a tie there mm -hmm. to Vietnam, but they, we get the benefit here. Well, did somebody else want to contribute to this question? Um, in Germany, in Frankfurt, there's an Air Force base. There's several different big cities in Germany, and uh, basically. People were either coming back from the NAM or right. going to the NAM. And our job, as we saw it, was a stopover mm. to um, prepare you if you're going back home. Mm. And if you're going over, um, you remember the Battle of Algiers, oh, the yes. movie? With the women, we would take our newspapers and we would go to the guest houses. The German girls hated to see us coming because when we got into the guest house, all the brothers, Hispanic, black, and even some white, they would go. <laughs> but all they wanted to do was touch us. They just wanted to touch you. And um, they had a place called... Um, I can't even remember, it was in the mountains. And if you were the kind of GI that gave them trouble, they sent you there. But uh, in Germany itself, outside of a little marijuana, hashish was the big, okay? When they wanted to stop the war, I can't remember what it was, who was it, Nixon or whatever. But the bottom line became this, then drugs, Shay after movie came out, mm. and that was the beginning of the end for political conversation. But I do think that the work that we did, a small group, and even with the black GIs who were organized, and the German left, Cody Wolf, Cody Wolf, and um, you know, we did some good work to help people because uh, war is a horrible thing. And um, everybody says something like, uh, well, if I had to shoot you or this, that, and the other, until you shoot somebody close and personal, mm. children and yeah. women, yeah. Mm -hmm. you, you have no idea. And a lot of the brothers and the Hispanic brothers, especially mm. the ones from Texas, I mean, they were like horrified. And they also recognized it wasn't the Vietnam, Viet Cong people they were fighting. They were also fighting the war back home. Because ever since World War II, there's a book called We Were There, uh, Black Soldiers in History, blah, blah, blah. Uh, ever since every person that has ever gone outside this country recognized you're fighting for a system that wants oil, diamonds, gold. But when you come back home... They didn't link your brother, and nobody knows who did it. Mm -hmm. So uh, that, that period of time, it galvanized the whole world, because that's what I did see. That's one thing. The whole world was like, am I next? Yeah. Is my country next? Mm -hmm. What are they doing? And we're still fighting, so um, it's a bitch. Thank you. My name is Gina Lee and I'm from Revolution Books in Berkeley, which is part of building a movement for revolution today. 
So I want, my question has to do with, Barbara mentioned that what was a beast in the 60s is now a monster. And I really agree with this. And I wanted to know what you thought, especially since there's been two years of protests against police murder. We have a choice between a, a fascist and a proven war criminal. This system is still a horror for people here and around the world. And I wanted to know how you all see what is the, both the need and the potential for revolution today? And one of the themes of this is where to go from here. I think that organizing small cadres of aware people, of knowers, of, of activists, I think that can be very, very effective because I see it happening all over this country. Mm -hmm. You know, whether it's dealing with, with food issues, or environmental issues. And I think that if people can concentrate more on the elected officials who run their cities, I think they can put more effective pressure on them. Because when you're talking about the president and all that, I mean, it's really not much you can do about that because mm -hmm. it's part of the system the way it works. But when you know who is representing you and who is going to affect your your school system and your 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 this and your your that you have more control and this is something we always used to say we need a community control so yeah join some of these large movements but also form small cadres mm -hmm. you know that you can uh, have a lot of strength with I think it's very effective. Yeah. I think it's a bottom up. We have to start on the bottom and push up. And young people are on the bottom, you know, they're on the ground. That's where the action has to be. Mm -hmm. Not from top, somebody up top, here yeah, explaining yeah. it. <laughs> and revolution is uh, not an act, it's a process. Mm -hmm. So uh, 50 years have gone by and uh, if you have a demonstration, I'm coming. <laughs> <laughs> um, so just for the next person coming to the mic, it's Mama Carolyn Rogers from Houston. I just want to thank her. She, she stayed in the line for quite some time. Yes. And um, as a young person, I respect my elders, and I felt really bad having her stand in the line. And <laughs> thank you to one of my high school students for giving up her seat. Um, and I know I should have trumped the mic and just given it to her over all the people. So thank you for being patient with me. Oh, you're more than welcome. I, I would like to thank the panel for a presentation that was so informative. And my question is to Barbara Cox. I would like to know the name of the book that you held up and if I can purchase the book and where can I get that book. All right, all right. Revolutionary Grain. Oh God, I can't see nothing. Celebrating the <laughs> celebrating the spirit of the Black Panther Party, Panthers in portraits and books. Uh, Susanna, Nikki, they're out there. They're right out front. What okay. this book deals with is uh, now. It's uh, like seventy-five portraits and stories of what we've been doing, what has happened to us in the last fifty years. You know, it's it's an excellent piece. Uh, Mama Charlotte's in it, Kat's in it, uh, Eddie's in it. Um, oh, there's so many people. We're all old Get now. Men. Get the Get book, y'all. Get the book. Get it's, the book. It's, it's, it's really being launched good. tomorrow. Yeah. Right? Yeah, well, what's tomorrow? Y'all, we thank y'all for coming. All power to the people. All power to the people. All right.